John Crossingham is a talented musician and songwriter based in Toronto, Ontario. Once the leader of a band called Raising the Fawn, Crossingham is an occasional member of Broken Social Scene and is one half of an explosive post-hardcore duo called Not Of. In July of 2018, No List released vinyl copies of Hypocritic Oath, Not Of's explosive and acclaimed second album, and the band has a few shows coming up as we speak. John and I connected a while back for a chat about Canadian politics and the current socio-cultural climate, the art pop of Raising the Fawn and his embrace of harsher rock tones in his own expression as he matures, his time in Broken Social Scene and an inspiring early show by Metz, some of the lyrical themes on Hypocritic Oath, What's Next for Not Of, and more. With the support of listeners like you who subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it and make flexible monthly pledges at patreon.com slash creative control, plus in-kind support from CFRU 93.3 FM, Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, which is home to Sonic Onion Records, this is the 459th episode of Creative Control featuring John Crossingham of Not Of with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hey, John. How's it going? Hi, Vish. I am doing quite well. How about yourself? (laughs) I'm well. It's nice to uh, see you. It's been uh, a little while since I think we've uh, been face-to-face. Yes. Probably like at a show or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hot Snakes was the most recent one. Was that the one that I recall? Were you at the the one at the Phoenix? Phoenix? Yeah, Yeah, that was an amazing show. It was. A weird night. Do you remember the night? It was the night of the election. Yes, the Ford one. Yeah, Uh, the Ontario election, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think I went in... Yes, I went into the venue not knowing but fearing what the result would be and yeah. kind of found out midway through and was grateful for some sort of release it's it's odd in this time to be comforted there, there, was, there was something interesting about being comforted by an election result you know by an american band that's given right how many they seem to know what was going american on. elections yeah. have gone you know the way that they have i think uh yeah there was something I think yeah they under they probably understood innately. I'm I'm a little I'm a little concerned about the fact that um and I count you and I among these these kinds of people like the progressive sort of people uh I don't want to assume too much of course but I it's weird that we keep getting blindsided by these election results because I feel like that was another one where there was a real sense that the left leaning uh NDP were were had a real shot at mm-hmm. winning that election uh, because everyone had written off the, the Liberal Party. Uh, they had essentially conceded um, prior to the race based on the polls. But uh, there was, I thought, uh, a sense that the NDP might win um, going into the night. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I would think uh, we're, uh, the, the, some, uh, some progressive people are uh, informed, maybe well-read, maybe checked things out but i again was su- not only surprised by the result but the the uh, landslide uh, of the result like that was like a yeah. definitive vote so yeah. do you have a take on that why are, uh, and again i don't mean to lump us uh, together oh uh, well no i i, first off, I, I don't <laughs> think it's too I- incorrect an assumption yeah. i mean uh, there may be some minutia we disagree yes, on but sure. I, th- I imagine we're pretty yeah. much on the same side of the ledger for most issues yeah I mean, I wasn't surprised by it, um, but um, and I don't mean for this to be um, for 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 me to appear like I haven't uh, like I've been kind of I've guessed it right over the last decade, twelve years or so. But I'm you know even going back to Rob Ford's mayoral election here and uh, the recent. Um, presidential election in the United States, and uh, and then what what happened with Doug Ford here? I, I felt, I think I felt sufficiently wary of the chances of of those people yeah. winning yeah. in every case, and and felt unnerved a little bit by the kind of um, overconfidence 
or dismissive nature that I think a lot of the left and progressives have had about those threats. Um, and whether it's whether it's just sort of kind of that classic city people kind of looking down at rural rubes, you know, yeah, yeah, totally. that, that sort yeah. of dismissive thing, or even if it's this kind of 538 you know, stat Nate stuff. Silver stat stuff where yeah. I'm, I'm really informed and this is how, this is why it's going to break down the way it's going to break down and I've got it covered. You know, there's always been overconfidence in that. I think a an inability to understand what is really important in terms of gaining power in, in this day and age and mm-hmm. keeping it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also a real, uh, very frustrating shyness about what one's true identity and assets are. And I think even looking at Mulcair's fate in the federal election, I mean, you could argue he that- He was the NDP candidate in the, sorry, I guess yeah. there's people listening potentially from all over the world, so I don't want to- yeah. So he, Mulcair, yeah. Yeah, Thomas Mulcair was the NDP yeah. candidate, so the further left, main main further left candidate in the last uh, uh, federal, federal election yeah. that we had, which Trudeau won. Yeah, uh, And you could argue that maybe the kind of cult of personality around Trudeau and the warmth and affection uh, and all these people who were all kind of liberal all the time. They just had to check out for a while because of how much that party had bottomed out. I mean, you could argue that Trudeau was going to win no matter what Melchior did. But this weird shyness about about far left politics and what it what it means and what it could mean for the future of a country like Canada. Shyness from whom, though? Well, I felt that he he ran. I mean, I can't, I mean I'm a little foggy on some of the details, but mm-hmm. I found that he was very. He felt more kind of center. Uh, that or, that is a recent thing. You now know, in, I think in, everyone has played in America and Canada. Uh, they thought it was it would make sense, right? If you're trying to go mainstream to go down the middle yeah. and appeal to both. But what we're seeing now is peop- uh, both sides are so entrenched, mm-hmm. uh, the left and the right, for lack of... And there's nuance there, of course. But I think people are, are more likely to get behind the people who are uh, similarly entrenched and less yeah. willing to compromise. Yeah. Oh, and I, I mean, we're reaching... I mean, the presidential election, I think, is a very good example of it as well, where, you know, there are... There are, again, I mean, too many lists, too many reasons to kind of unpack on a list right now in terms of why Hillary lost. And misogyny is definitely a big one. There's no question about that. There's also how much she was tied up in not one but two past administrations, which carried a lot of baggage in that if you disliked Obama and or Bill Clinton, um, Hillary had to carry that baggage as well. But um, I still, you know. It's obviously unprovable, <laughs> really, but I still hold firm to the idea that Bernie Sanders would have won that election had he run. But and and I think that's fair. Yeah. The reason for that is that he uh, he was uh, left left populist, and he also he was the kind of person, not Hillary, who would have been able to win in those states that Trump held yeah. that really cost the election. So states like Michigan and Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah. He had the states she of, didn't visit. Yeah. yeah. And she and he, he but he and he won those. Yeah. Uh in in the Democratic primaries. Oh Sanders did, yeah. Sanders that's true. Did. He yeah. won those. And the Clinton campaign similarly was yeah. like, we're gonna take Michigan. We've got it. Sanders clobbered her. And yeah. he clobbered her because he was tapping into the same, you know, a left wing version of it, but he was tapping into the same kind of feelings and sentiment that Trump did. Right. On the right, right, and uh, I think that's that's where Canada too is in a lot of ways, you know. And uh, we like uh, so it's it's been bizarre. Trump's ascent, we had a real, we had a preview of it with Rob Ford here, and, 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 and no one really yeah. seemed to clue into that seriously. And then likewise, uh, Doug Ford's ascent was. It was predicated, you know. There was a there was a preview of that in in Trump in the states, and I think you know it's we we Canadian and American politics aren't that dissimilar. No, and certainly Ontario you know? and American yeah. politics are not that dissimilar. Ontario yeah. might be a little microcosm of what's going on. Yeah, and I think within those two figures as well is this rise of anti intellectualism, uh, mm-hmm. anti expertise. Even yeah, I, for I don't sure. know. I don't know what you lived in Toronto and under Ford, right? Like you were here when he was the mayor. Yeah, so. I mean, what do you, I, I often, whenever I visited and I was on the subway or something, 
I would look around and think, man, someone on here has probably voted for Rob Ford, and it would freak me out. Well, I mean, I was just down in the States visiting uh, my folks who have, uh, they've had a cottage um, in the States for about 20, 25 years. And Where, I was whereabouts? Just, um, near, uh, on, on Lake Chautauqua, which is, it's very close to the uh, Pennsylvania-New York border. Oh, okay. So it's about maybe an hour, 45 minutes or so outside of um, Buffalo. Okay. Uh, it's uh, near Fredonia, which is, I think, actually where the Buffalo Bills have their, their training. Okay. Their, like, kind of summer training or whatever, preseason training and stuff. But I was down there, and, yeah, they, they're, a lot of this is projection yes. on my part, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, But there was a, in your walking around and, and people in pickup trucks and Eagle T-shirts and all this kind of stuff, and it, it that weight of the Trump yeah. kind of... Um, momentum in the states it was very unnerving for me and i yeah i mean i didn't i didn't feel comfortable and and it's uh i think uh yeah as as i know you're a parent yeah like yeah too, yeah i mean it's i think a lot about very hard yeah i mean there's a yeah there's so many different places we can go with this the, the kavanaugh thing uh yes. is is very much on my mind i'm guessing it's on yours yep. my wife has been almost <laughs> inconsolable over the absolutely. last little while yeah absolutely about what's been happening and uh the responsibility that uh i have to um raise a, a daughter and especially a son in this climate i i accidentally said that you know? yesterday i said man it's to my wife and maybe to a friend as well uh it's just so unnerving for me as a father of a daughter and then i stopped myself and said actually it's more unnerving as a uh, as a father of a son yeah he's the one i need to and i'm not worried about him per se um in terms of his demeanor or his civility or respect level like at this point he's only seven but so I'm not fearful of it. He's he seems very um, he seems to understand that you mm-hmm. know certain personal space. We always talk about personal space and and respecting other people's uh, uh, when they say no, when his sister says no or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like you respect that, and I'm not worried about it on that level. But yeah, it's very stressful as a parent to know uh, this is the world that's coming uh, as they get older and are more engaged with these kinds of mm-hmm. news stories and. Why is this happening? And yeah, I uh, wanted to ask you if you felt like this stuff that we're talking about um, is kind of conveyed in the music of not of in some way. Like, I, I, is because I uh, I come from a post hardcore mm-hmm. background where uh, I was thinking about this as I was listening to your record, uh, which is great, by the way. Thank you. It was awesome. Thanks. Um, I was thinking about when I was younger and we would write uh, songs like this and we would, I would spend time kind of writing, articulating my thoughts on a piece of paper Mm -hmm. and then I would go play a show or we would make a record and then I would just scream my head off or we would scream our heads off. And so that articulation is kind of lost, that enunciation of the idea is lost in the roar of uh, not only screaming vocals, uh, but um, buried in the mix almost sometimes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. all of those things and kind of floated in my head. As I, and I was thinking about Shallow North Dakota when I would see that band. And I know you just saw yeah, yeah. them play a yeah. pretty pretty rare reunion show, right? Yeah, they're just, uh, they literally played in Winnipeg opening for Ken Mode last night. So I think they're doing three dates with Ken Mode and then a, a, a run of shows. But yeah, I mean, that was for both for both Dave and I, my bandmate, um, our friendship was practically, you know, that was uh, seeing Shallow and Kittens was kind of like a, a catalyst for us. Yeah, this was a band. Becoming friends. Those so. were bands in the sort of mid '90s, mm-hmm. uh, and and I kind of thought of them as part of like the Sonic Onion scene. Yep. Uh, yeah. 100%. Based in Hamilton, and and you were in a band called Raising the Fawn mm-hmm. that put out records on Sonic Onion, yep. as I recall. Yep. Uh, so there's some kinship there. I just didn't know how much you loved. I didn't know Shallow North Dakota was back. Uh, oh well, I mean that's a really recent thing. Like, I mean, are they, they back back? I think they're just. I think they're playing shows. Mm. And whether they'll do stuff. Um, Biff, the bass player in Shallow, he has another band called Backbiters, mm. and uh, uh, not of has played a few shows with them. And, right. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it was just kind of this uh, out of the blue. It was like, yeah, I think we're gonna do this. That's cool. Sort of thing. And did you play with them? Did not have play with Shallow? No, uh, no, oh, we okay. didn't. Uh, well, I hope to soon. But oh. uh, if we if we can work it, but. But uh, uh, sorry, where so, I was going with this yeah. was this notion of 
you know, you're a thoughtful guy, and I know you from various uh, other musical uh, projects and bands that aren't, to my recollection, very similar to what you're doing and not yeah. of. And and now you're in a position where, as we were just discussing, you know, the world is yeah. pretty messed up. And all I'm asking is, how do you, if you, capture that within this band and the rage that I hear in this band? Yeah, I think it's definitely in there. Um, one of the things that I, I started off, um, like previous bands, a lot of my writing was very, very specific and personal. I mean, even <laughs> the very first Raising the Fawn record was quite literally a, a letter to my wife. <laughs> and the it whole was thing. kind of like, yeah, yeah, I mean, it was basically like a, the lyric sheet was was written out like a letter and it was, you know, this 10 song thing that kind of tracked our relationship and various sort of ups and downs mm. and, and whatever. So, uh, you know, I this mean. This was before you were married? This is before we were married. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, so, you know, I've always had that kind of element in in what I did. And the the whole thing with Not Of was, um, for one, yeah, this is pretty unlike any band that I had been in before, but I had been a fan of, you know, I mean, a lot of my favorite bands were things like Jesus Lizard and Drive Like Jehu and Jawbox and Fugazi and Kittens and Shallow North Dakota. And I mean, I always loved all of these sorts of bands. I think I just didn't, I never, I never was at this point where I felt comfortable accessing it as a, as a musician. There were other things that I I felt more comfortable doing. And uh, really, one of the big things that, that got this going for me was I remember going to see um, see Obitz at Horseshoe and Mets opened Mets opened show. up for, I was at that show. Yeah, and... Um, it was an early show for Mets on some level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is well before, yeah. I mean, this is like two and a half years at least before that Sub Pop record came out. They had I wanted to say it was like, two singles out. Maybe the third one had been out by then. Some, yeah, something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, they were a little more kind of noisy and abstract, um, but it was still great, and... Uh, my friend, John Drew, uh, who's a recording engineer, he's done Fucked Up and uh, uh, Tokyo Police Club and a bunch of other stuff, and was actually in the drummer and raising the farm for a while, too. Oh, okay. He was there, and he's like, oh, yeah, I love these guys. They're, they're, they're great. Da, 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 da. And he'd been friends with Chris for a long time, and he was just talking them up. And, and I thought they were terrific. And this was kind of in my hiatus after I'd stopped playing music for a while. Yeah. And I was loosely writing things, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do next, and you know, I was just busy raising a family and yep. cooking and having a job and all that sort of stuff. Right. And um, seeing them was just this kind of real shock to the system of genuinely like, oh, there are bands locally that are making music like this. I had no idea because everything that I was familiar with on the local scene kind of was sort of in still in that social scene sort of radius or, you know, things that kind of had come, had been birthed out of things like Arcade Fire and Social Scene. So these like kind of like multi-ensemble mm -hmm. sort of art pop stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, there's three guys up there with their amps all cranked to ear bleeding levels and they're just screaming and, you know, and, and people were into it. And it was just like, th this is really inspiring yeah. to me because yeah. I, I feel I feel a kinship with this. And I was like, maybe this is what I'll do. And I'd always really enjoyed... I had in my head I, uh, somewhere I was like I really like to do a duo, and uh, Dave happened to be free, uh, and Dave Dunham had we, we were friends for a long time, and he played in a band also in Sonic Onion called Chore for mm -hmm, years. Mm -hmm. He was a drummer in Chore and just an awesome player. And I was kind of like you know, he's heavy, but he also makes he he's made his own like kind of synthy dance music and stuff. Big like techno kind of guy as well like a real stickler for rhythm. And I was kind of like, if I'm ever going to play as duo, I really want a drummer who can just like hold it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, we why, loved Why a duo, by the way? I just, I really thought it would be an interesting challenge. Raising the Fawn yeah. was what, four or five people? Uh, it fluctuated between three and four. Three and four, okay. So, and right. then Social Scene was obviously a million kind of thing. Um, and but, were you like a... You kind of came to social scene a little later in I the... I did, yeah. yeah. Um, we had Raising the Fawn show, a uh, wavelength gig, and uh, Kevin was doing a solo thing. Uh -huh. And we played, and afterwards he um, he came up, 
uh, to me when I was working at Soundscapes one day. Ran, hey, I really enjoyed that show, and we're thinking of putting something together, and and it just sort oh, of happened. like Broken Social Scene hadn't started yet. It it, it had, uh. um, and Feel Good Lost to come out, right? But they were kind of like we're, we want to put together a band to start playing some of this live. Oh, so you were in the and to put some things together. Oh, okay, you were involved at that stage, you yeah, know, earlier so, earlier stage. Yeah, I, I kind of think yeah. of you as joining a bit later in the in the band's yeah. With, it's kind of funny because <laughs> the. You Forgotten People era, I played, I was part of that recording oh, of the whole were? record okay. and yeah. writing for it, and then I left. <laughs> oh, okay. Because it was just silly um, now, but I left mainly because Raising the Fawn was about to start touring, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I was kind of like, I was going to go from, you know, just playing shows locally for the most part to suddenly tour, you know, two bands really going for it, mm-hmm. and I just felt like I couldn't commit yeah, sure. to both of them, sure. and, and so I backed out, and they were... So, you know, Kevin and Brennan were like, you need to do that. <laughs> and, you know, it, I only really needed to kind of look around and see, I mean, between Metric and Stars and Do Makes yeah. and all, you know, there are all these bands who are just, none of them were leaving the projects. But I just had this. Even though of, they had the other, yeah, I see what I you're saying. I had this very yeah. Puritan ish kind of responsibility right. and small town. I don't know, like where I was like, I should, I should be there. And if I can't be there 100%, I shouldn't you know, kind of commit. So I backed out and then, you know, I became a part of the orbit again and did a bunch of tours and yeah. sort of by time of the self-titled record coming out, I wasn't, I wasn't on that record, but, um, I had been playing a fair bit and then I was a full bore member of that touring were, band for about a year and a half. You were on Letterman. You guys got to play yeah. Letterman. That's I like, got that's, to play Letterman and Conan, which was uh, unbelievable. Those oh, are my yeah. heroes, those guys. So yeah, it was, yeah. uh, yeah, I got to shake, uh, Conan's hand and yeah. all that stuff yeah. and it was pretty it was pretty <laughs> exceptional it feels and every once in a while if someone will bring that up it's like oh yeah I was talking to an old friend from high school I hadn't been in touch with in ages and he was just like yeah I showed my uh, my kids you on, on Letterman kind of thing yeah, you right. know? and it's like so yeah it's funny but anyway um, how this also relates to like playing in the duo yeah. um, I just really wanted that the Spartan nature of it and I'm also a bit of a control freak, and I, mm-hmm. I just was, I had I, I had in my mind is this challenge where I was like, I really want to create a guitar sound where I've got even a good bass tone mm-hmm. involved and, and everything, and, you know, from like a like a guitar kind of gear geek side of things. Right. I wanted, I, I just like, I think I can do this. Right. I basically wanted to, I wanted to sound as powerful and impactful as Mets, yeah, but with two people. With two people, that was the whole idea. And Mets, especially the first record, um, them and Hot Snakes and a couple other things were like, and a bit of Queens, Queens of Stone Age and stuff. You know, some of their simpler tunes. Or, yeah, that was really the template for that for the very first record that right. we made, Peak. And everything on it was, I was also, as a shorthand, uh, I was sort of saying like I I was trying to write dumb. Hmm. Lyric wise, and this isn't like a, a a diss to any of any of the bands I've just named, but I always found like um, the the, the be- a better thing as opposed to writing dumb was maybe like more like write obliquely. I had a really hard time kind of avoiding being specific. I think in a lot of the things that I wrote. So the first record, I was trying to write just like kind of impressionistic almost, and use real really guttural words and and images and just kind of first instinct things, not over revised words. And okay. so really speak about stuff that was just blunt. Well, what I was getting to earlier is when I was talking about how enunciation kind of goes out the window in, yeah. in, in this form a little bit is that I feel like there's become a, a kind of template that's, that makes it sound too frig, uh, uh, rigid, but there's this template in terms of phrasing in mm-hmm. some of this music yeah, that I think is interesting. Like everyone kind of at some point does the same kind of, I, I'm not going to mimic it now, yeah. but there's just a certain kind of like, bah, 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 bah. like there's just like a, a way of, of singing. Yeah. Uh, and it suits the, the rhythm, the rhythmic, uh, it's a rhythmic way of singing yeah. and it kind of matches the rhythm of, of a lot of what I would call post hardcore music. Yeah. And um, so I think I know what you mean. Like I think, and when you're, in that zone, and and it sounds like when you started, you were inspired, but it was a little like you were emulating yeah. some of the things you were yep. hearing and seeing to try to tap into it because as yep. much as you were a fan, it was sort of new. To, and by the way, Mets 
also like Mets the guys in Mets had been playing music in different configurations for a long time but Mets yep. really took off when they were in their early 30s or something like yep. that right yep. so they're older guys they are yeah and I often I often think if I was in another band it would sound kind of like not of yeah even though uh I, like you I have a I would say there are multitudes in terms of music within me right there's yep. lots of interests and and other times I'm like oh maybe I just write quiet things you know because it just yep. depends on my my day and, and my mood or whatever and um and I don't do it very much anyway, but it's just something I've always thought of. It'd be cool to be in a band like that, you know? I, that was the, really, the, that was really like the thing. It was yeah. like, I just, at this point in, in time, I just want to be in a band that's going to be really fun because I don't have any illusions of it making money or being a big thing and I can't afford to hit the road sure. with it anyway. So I just want it to be really fun. And I think what I was longing for was something that had a release to it that had a, a kind of like both sonic and emotional lyrical catharsis. And with this new record, I tried to push that more, like to to be a little more articulate again with some of the things I was writing. And also, you know, I think the the there are songs on Hi Hypocritic Oath that could be on peak, but there are a lot of songs that wouldn't. Yeah. And I just wanted to try and let a little more daylight in i think now it's like peak had a very vice-like grip on on how on how it was uh conceived and um it's overall sort of um attack the, yeah yeah attack for yeah, sure yeah. and you know quite literally even and i with mean yeah, the, yeah I, with I, this one I, yeah it's like i wanted to i wanted to step back and so that's where things like you believers and the goat and some of the more like um, uh, instrumental and or sort of sound collage kind of moments and stuff came into play whereas like I, I was just longing for more for a little more daylight in there and, and I think it's been very telling that those are for Dave and I those are s some of our favorite songs to play right now it's, I, fa know. it's a fascinating record that way because for every moment where I'm like oh this kind of reminds me of Flag Camp or the Jesus Lizard yeah. by the end it sounds like Eric Cheneau like there's like an acoustic kind of uh, uh, right. yeah, yeah. sort of end and conclusion I suppose and, and so there is this sense that it's a dynamic record and like when I think of Raising the Fawn um, that was a, I guess would you describe that as like a post-punk band there was an intensity to Raising the Fawn that a mathematical yeah like coming from hardcore uh and post hardcore which had sort of um these uh this musical sophistication to it i mean that's what we kind of mm -hmm. i think like the whatever like the jazz elements or whatever mm -hmm. like the kind of time signature stuff and the intricate uh guitar playing and 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 all that stuff i when i think of raising the fawn uh, that is what I remember a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, like that was there for you, right? You seemed. I think we, we were more like that live. For yeah, sure. live. And some of the later records got more that way. Yeah. It started off as a real. I was really inspired by bands like Low and Codeine and yes. stuff. Yeah. And so it started off being a very like slow core right. sort of band, and um, and then it it got it got more muscular. And I think also you know it was I was listening. There was this part of me too where I think, like any concept, it started off being very clear mm -hmm. what the band was going to be, mm -hmm. and then you make, you know, we made an EP and and four full length records. So by the last couple records, it's like what what it, we wanted it to be. I mean, I was listening to a lot of heavier stuff, yeah, you know, and so it was like I was listening more and more to things like Converge or uh, you know Aaron Turner's. Uh, band Isis and you know just things that were uh, things that were heavy but had uh, had an artfulness to them yeah. and I was kind of like I, I think there are ways that I can graft this a little onto what we were doing and in the end you know it kind of pulled it kind of that and just the overall exhaustion of touring and whatever kind of pulled the band apart in a way but yeah I, it led to some led to some interesting stuff but I, I think it was the heaviness was always really grafted on raising the fawn kind of forcefully mm. Mm. whereas this it's uh, it's m more the intent and you know i i want i'm just i'm fast i want to create a band that is musically at least to people at their most sort of sonically 
overwhelming. I, right. I think you know. I right. mean, um, I still want hooks. I still want. I still want groove. I still want riffs. I still, you know, it's like I don't want it. To, it's not meant to just be kind of you know, noise, but I want there to be a lot of noise. I yeah. want there to be a yeah. lot of kind of like sa- the sound of things kind of being pushed too hard. And then lyrically, the the themes are. You know, th- this record is not a concept record, but loosely it's kind of about uh, looking in the mirror at oneself and not being especially um, especially pleased with what you're seeing. Right. And and those cover, that covers a lot of things. And I've also, again, tried to write in a way where others can transpose their own sort of similar experiences upon it. Um, so it is a, you were saying that one of the things that you viewed as a distinction between raising the fawn and not of is that raising the fawn was more personal mm -hmm. songwriting, Mm -hmm. but now you're saying that on some level, this not of record is a a little bit of literal self-reflection. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, but I think, but it's also meant to be something where. I'm I, I trying more, I think, with this to keep the door open for other experiences. So I, I'm trying not to, like, I'll, when I would write and raising the fawn, it's like, I mean, I would struggle to think of an exact example of it, but it was almost like, <laughs> I remember that, you know, that time you sure, walked into sure. the such and such cafe or whatever, you know, it was so, like so we really reference one distinction. Is it love songs versus another kind of personal songwriting? Yeah, and but also also just that I'm trying to I try to pull back and and you know how can I write more about what that feeling is like or that particular sort of conflict is like rather than writing about a conflict you know what uh, uh. you know like I, the way that i think about it actually a lot to kind of come a little back to what we were thinking about earlier about politics um when and raising our kids in yeah, this sort of world yeah, yeah when i was i was getting my hair cut the other day and i was talking to the talking to the person cutting my hair and and uh we were talking about kavanaugh and i was saying how when I'm trying to discuss these things with my kids who are 11 and five and a half. Right. So my, you know, my five and a half year old asks, is Brett Kavanaugh a bad man? (laughs) I was like, okay, so where do we go with this? And I was saying that I'm try, I try really hard to speak about these things in ways that are not specific to that event. So I'm not going to say Brett Kavanaugh is a bad man because of this, this, and this, but I, try to talk about well in this particular situation um this is you know this is the sort of job he's going up for yeah yeah you know this is why it's an important job this is why it's important for a person going for that kind of job to have certain qualities Mm -hmm. this is why people are so in other words like trying to talk about um not just about a specific event, but the general things that create that kind of political conflict and situation and to inform critical thought. Yeah. So that whatever lesson is there, it's something that my kids can transpose onto a variety of, of situations and be like, so it, it's less, how do I understand the, breath, the, the Brett Kavanaugh situation, but more, how do I understand um, uh, navigating uh, women's rights, and you know um sexual assault um alongside this patriarchy and what does it mean to be a a bad man what is what is male culture right you know what is what is power all this sort of stuff and and i'm trying to write with not of in that way too so that it's less this is this is an, an exact me writing about this exact event you know, I try to reflect a little bit more on how I'm feeling about certain issues and then go, you know, what's my overall takeaway on that? So there's always, you know, You Believers was inspired by my uncle dying. Um, uh, you know, Astoria Jack was inspired by uh, a review that I wrote about um, a Beverly's record. Oh. Uh, and where I kind of, after writing it, inadvertently realized that I'd 
been kind of sexist in, oh. in how I'd written oh, about it okay. while still trying to be supportive mm. and kind of really like going, okay, so what is it really, you know? What? When did you write that review? Uh, it was like, I don't know, maybe two and a half years ago, two oh, okay. years ago. Okay. Um, but you know what I mean? So there's, there's always a, a catalyst, but then I'm trying to write hopefully about like a larger yeah universal stuff larger that, issue. That, so, that might be more relatable yeah so you yeah. so you believers was inspired by a particular thing but it's really me thinking about what is how can you be how do you comfort yourself as an atheist in mm. times of trouble right i see <laughs> you know I, I, which i think you know that's really about uh religion as a as kind of um a lodestone you know uh, and a, a bomb Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, B A L M. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. you know, and yeah. and how I think a lot of people go to religion at, at a very they need it most at a weak point in their lives. Mm-hmm. And as an atheist and a kind of a science guy, you don't get that same sort of comfort necessarily, right? Uh, when you know someone that you love passes, and you you're you're looking. You're looking for something to wrap yourself up in, and it's some sort of meaning, and why why this happened? Is it, you know, what is? It, how do I make sense of it? And, yeah, when you, you know. when you're uh, I, when you're an atheist, I suppose you, on some level, not to, not in totality, but you kind of believe in nothing, uh, on 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 a faith based level, mm. and so when someone passes away, I guess you're forced to confront the fact that they have entered nothing. Um, as opposed to thinking, if you're a religious person, you'd be like, "Oh, they went somewhere. Yeah, they they went to somewhere, some other place." Yeah. But if your core belief is there is no other place, uh, <laughs> then yeah. yeah, that's a that's a weird existential moment uh, that only death or the threat of death, I think, can t- can bring about. Um, I I wanted to pick up on something though that we were uh, that's very fascinating. I but I, I, I do you think it's a coincidence that in this strange time, angry time, uh, in Toronto and now in the world, that loud music is sort of one refuge for people like yourself? Like, do you think it's a... When I ask mm-hmm. if anything in the air, so to speak, has entered not of in terms of lyrical content. Yeah. But even the, yeah. the sonic attack that you saw Mets, well, that must have been eight years ago or something, that show that we were talking about. Oh, yeah, at least, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So... And I do think that, you know, I think Fucked Up had a role in this too, but Mets in particular in terms of noisy uh, pop-oriented rock music, Mm -hmm. they seem to kickstart something in the city, Uh, maybe in some ways more than I think Fucked Up probably, um, and bands like Fucked Up. And the whole, were you, did you know like the Who's Emma scene in the 90s? Like, did you know the Who's Emma club? You were in St. Catharines. I was in St. Catharines, yeah. So Toronto, like, it's now Paul's Boutique. Right, In yes. Kensington Market. Yep. But it used to be a venue called Who's Emma, and some of us would go there to see kind of underground yep. loud music, and that's where I first met Mike from Fucked Up. So there was kind of this sense that, for me anyway, the same way, like, we try to trace, like, where did where did arts and crafts come from? Where did yeah. Three Gut come from? Yeah. Where were there... Yeah hubs like what what fostered that like was yeah. it ted's wrecking yard was it wavelength what, what was it mm-hmm. uh and so i don't know i don't mean to ask you to trace this but i do think that rob ford and his ilk rose in toronto yeah mets started to come up people started to pay more attention to fucked up also coming from a maybe a not the same but a similar kind of place of of um uh hope induced anger or something like a, a yeah. sense that they wanted to change things but it was coming from a a forceful place do you think that's a coincidence that you gravitated towards louder music when things seem to be going sideways in the world um i mean i think i think it's a i think it's maybe a happy coincidence okay yeah. you know yeah. i mean like i said earlier i mean these um dave and i our friendship was almost you know in, in some ways was almost formed over you know i remember giving him yank crime and Drive like Jay and him yeah. being like you know holy shit what is this right. kind of thing and and uh that was uh you know bands like that and jawbox and you know uh, and and again shallow and kittens i mean they were a formative part and this this would have been when i was in you know like 19 20 21 22 you know like that really my first band, your formative Onion, time, you know, yeah. very formative. And Sonic Onion was a, was just kind of starting, and so 
Which I was mean, a very eclectic label. It was a very eclectic. It, I, yeah, I I do think I do think uh, you know, uh, Sonic Onion is a little unsung in oh, terms absolutely. of the in terms of the variety of stuff that they fostered. I mean, yeah. if you, even just from Shallow to Hayden alone, yeah, yeah. it's 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 pretty mind blowing. Tristan Psionic was an incredible band to to see, and I like yep. their records. Like the, the, those guys, sort of uh, yeah. Uh, really, start, Tim and Mark in particular were uh, the, still working at Sonic Onion, and yeah, it was. It was, uh, I think, because it had a bit of a chip on its shoulder. It was like the upstart Hamilton label, kind of pushing uh, against yeah, the yeah. Toronto music industry. Totally, and yeah. and as of someone from St. Catharines, it I related to that idea yes. of yeah. oh, you know, this doesn't all have to come from, uh, it doesn't all have to come from Toronto yeah. or a major kind of center. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, so there's there's. There, a part of it is like, oh, I'm finally getting around to this. But there is also a reason that I'm getting around to it now. And mm-hmm. I, I think that I just, it under, it it just makes sense to me as as music now more than it ever has. Yeah. Because I'm not wrapped up in, in it because of a sort of like youthful... Um, Nostalgia? I don't know. I don't think it's a nostalgia thing. And I'm also not in this sort of like youthful sort of petulance, you know, where it's like, fuck you, mom and dad. And, you no, know, it's I like, think you know, it, that's cause, a, that's, cause it's like yeah. the, now where I'm investing yeah. in it, it's as a, a more of a mature person, a mature thinker. And like, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that heavy music is the artfulness of heavy music, I think, is is really underrated. Uh, yeah, and I, you know, and, and I think it yeah. has been for a long time, and yeah. I think it continues to be, and um, it is, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know what to say other than it just it moves me, yeah. And so I want to be a part of that yeah. community, and yeah. I, I want to be a part of of that movement. Uh, and you know, it's um, it's still more you know more than ever making this record especially finishing it off and listening back to it i it's still a place where subtlety can exist it's still a place where you can you can express complex emotion and i think that's the thing too it 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 um it often gets typecast as kind of something that is really just uh you know a hammer yeah. you know a yeah. very blunt instrument and um but there's a lot of nuance there. I yeah, yeah, I think there's a there's a ton of nuance and um just uh you know, one of my favorite bands right now is Sumac. Right. And um you know, he says as he's wearing a Sumac t-shirt, but you know. <laughs> but you know, their their and their new record I think is a total masterpiece and and uh they did that er, an earlier record this year with uh, KG uh, Hino mm-hmm. from uh Japan experimental musician and it's also great. And, um, you know, I remember there was a column in a magnet in one of those back page, you know, used to, the back page of magnet used to be this kind of like sarcastic, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. really almost like the, the closest thing they got to like vice right. style writing. Yeah. I can't remember who did it, but he, I remember he had this one column it was around the time when absence of truth, uh, the ISIS record came out, but he did this whole thing on kind of bands like that, mm. where it was just like, what self-respecting. 33 or 34 year old you know would be like uh, you know would be like screaming and growling and it's yeah like, that's that's just for for kids and everything and on the, on the new sumac record there's these no doubt inspired a lot by working with Hino, but there's mm-hmm. these vocal things that he's doing uh aaron's doing on a couple of tracks just these howls and they're incredible yeah they're, they're highly emotive and they there are lyrics there but it's that thing where it's the way just like any great singer you know uh and i am a fan of you know great singers right you know yeah, as sure. traditionally great singers sure. like aretha franklin and sam cook and you know yeah. al green and jeff buckley and whatever you know it's like they all that stuff matters but it's uh it's a vocal expression and mm-hmm. there's one moment on on the first track the task a very it's probably about two thirds of this it's like a 24 minute song it's like two thirds of the way through it he lets out this one howl and it's just you can't you can't hear it and not register yeah 
an emotional response. Right. It communicates something. Yeah. And um, I think I'm only just starting to scratch the surface, I think, of what the two of us can do in this band yeah. of. But yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm invested in in between the guitar tone and what I'm trying to do vocally, I'm invested in more and more trying to uncover those moments. I, I want to make heavy music that, you know, it's it'll sound good, you know, it sounds good in a car and yeah, yeah. whatever, all that shit. Yeah. But I also really want it to be, I want there to be moments that stick with, with people and that mm-hmm. create a kind of, um, that, you know, just, Set something off, I, you know, because um, another, uh, another one of my f- favorite bands for years and years, Low, just released probably the most sonically abrasive and bold record of their whole career. Yeah. And listening to that, too, it's like they're just assaulting their own songs in terms of the production that they've done. Yeah, right. And the amounts of, like, distortion, and we're going to put this heavy, you know, cutout so that the, the vocals are just gone. And, you know, you it's like maybe track eight is the first moment on that record where you actually hear kind of vocal and guitar on its own. And, and, and you really can, you can hear it as clear as you would normally on a low album. And I think they're, they're doing something there that is, I mean, it's art, you know, there's a, there's a brutality to it. And, uh, Michael Barkley, who I know, you know, as well, and great, great writer, uh, great critic. When I was posting on Facebook about how much I love that record, he commented something to the effect of, that record sounds like 2018 feels. That's what I was getting at. That's what I'm getting at, generally. Yeah. I feel like I don't have... It's it's impossible to generalize, but I think the uptick in sort of more abrasive sounds... Yeah. Uh, even if, the, even if um, sort of feelings and sentiments about this era are not articulated as clearly by some as others I've, like the new mud honey album is the most blunt yeah. overt which i'm discussion excited to yeah. about what's going on right now um and and i think other people um yourself included and and, and a band like low i think they're taking a, a more subtle approach to these sort of feelings mm-hmm. and trying to articulate what's going on and or what, what they think is going on in the world and putting it into their songs but i think yeah, when a band like Low is starting to get more aggressive as they go on, I mm-hmm. I think that's a response to what's happening in in the world a little bit. So that's what I was getting at with yeah. in terms of the rise of uh, noisier uh, rock bands in in this city and around the world. I think it is one way of dealing with it on a both on a cathartic level, mm-hmm. but also on a way of trying to intellectually deal with mm-hmm. this sh- shit. So I mean. The one thing I would say too, because I agree with you, yeah, and I also feel like it's great to have these feelings and play in a band where I'm they have those this feel of use, <laughs> yeah, 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 to them, yeah. and you know, so I don't, I'm not like kind of like, oh man, the w- world's a fucking yeah. dumpster fire, and yeah. uh, now I got to go up and sing this these pop songs and I don't understand like it's just it's just I can't get myself fired up to do it I'm always yeah. fired up yeah. to, to do it yeah but I think you know it's it feels it feels very underground like one thing th- you know when I look around at what people are actually buying and consuming it's, it feels a very it's a very resistancey yes sort of thing it's a very you know and I think there are, there are people out there who want it and they're craving it but yeah, I, I I also like guitars. Feel kind of dead. They did. You I know? think they're back. I, I maybe they are. You know, I'm yeah. I'm curious how much they're like what the younger. I know there are some out there, but a lot of the bands that I'm thinking of, like you mentioned, Mud Honey, and where you know I'm 44. Yeah, uh, guys in Sumac are old. Lowe's old. Yeah. you know, it's like there's a lot of old people who I think are 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 getting into it, um, and. I, I, I'm sure there are younger people playing guitars this sort of way, and um, but you know, it's there's a lot of there's a lot of pop music. And, yeah, and, but yeah, and it's and um, I so I don't know. It's like I'm I'm using an instrument 
um, in every sense of the word, mm-hmm. you know, that is familiar to me and mm-hmm. that resonates with me. And I've also tried to be very understanding of the fact that I'm, you know, I'm of, I'm of my time and yeah. I'm that old guy playing, yeah. playing my music now, you know? Well, I mean, I, I will say I'm glad you are. Thank you. And I think the record's great and the band is is excellent. Um, what is next for you and for Not Of? And by the way, I mean, I've seen Broken Social Scene seem to be back. Are, yeah. are you part of any of that stuff? Not really. No. Um, I was talking to Kevin a bit. Um, uh, uh, just texted him a couple days ago. And uh, the one song I played guitar on, on the final only bonus track on the last record. Yeah. Um, and that just came on Spotify. So if you want to hear Old Dead Young and didn't buy right. the vinyl, it's on there now. You can listen to it. But um, uh, so, I mean, I'm sort of there. I mean, this is a whole other conversation. I, I was I had to get away from that. And it's nothing against anyone yeah. in that band at all. Yeah. I, I had to get away from uh, like 99 percent of the time. I'm really happy with the fact that I left social scene in the rear view and it could also be argued that it was going to happen anyway. Right. Uh, but <laughs> when I see them sort of doing their thing, it's like, I, I, you know, I get cognizant of the fact that uh, I sort of sabotage that and through my potential to kind of play music at that level, you know, in terms of like for hundreds and even thousands of people kind of sure. night after night sure. and, and everything. But it's its own slog. Yes. And, yeah. And... And I know why I stepped away. So I kind of, I, I root for them. Yeah, sure. You know, yeah. and, uh, and I think, uh, I root for them and I, I, I really love a lot of the people in that band a lot. And they've shown me a tremendous amount of, um, of, you know, warmth and sure. support. And, uh, it's just, uh, yeah, my own sort of human fragility. I'm kind of like, I need to. <laughs> that's fair. No, that's fair. And I mean, you've Step got your away. you've got your own stuff going on, yeah, obviously. So and, I mean, I think too. You know, it's like I still remember being on tour. We were with Social Scene. We were, we were playing a show in uh, somewhere in I think it, I think it was in Vienna, and uh, we were just kind of in our own worlds, getting ready for the gig. And I was walking around. I was listening to Cursed Two. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which I was obsessed with at the time. It had just come out, and I was just like, holy shit, this record, this fucking record. And I remember uh, listening to it, and Kevin was like, what do you listen to? And I put the headphones on. And, Him, yeah. And he was just kind of like, mm. yeah. just sort of gave the head shake and gave yeah. me the <laughs> headphones back. And it's like, um, I'm a, we're, a, I, you know, I'm, we're a bit of a different world. Sure, It's yeah. like the kind of music that I'm making right now, it is what I'm most happy with. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, it's like we're starting to work on new stuff already and, and I'm hopeful, uh, that we'll be able to do it for quite a while. It yet. sounds, sounds like you're in it. Like both of you are on the same page with what it, it can be and what it is. So I think that's, that's heartening. Um, for people who don't know, not of that well, where can we send them to learn more about them? I know you have a Bandcamp page and a website. Yeah, a uh, Bandcamp page, so notof.bandcamp.com. Yeah. Uh, is really the best place to go. Both of our records are on there. Yep. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's... That's the best place to go. I think go. it's probably the best place, and, you know, like every other band, we have a Instagram and sure, a sure. Twitter that I use fairly infrequently. I don't understand and twitter really but uh <laughs> but you know it's um yeah that's the best spot okay and, and both the records are on there and and also uh uh the no list uh store which is our record label um who put out the vinyl for hypocritic oath and their old uh winnipeg uh label um and in fact uh they released a split between kittens and shallow right that's right oh yeah i have that the thing somewhere love. Yeah. yeah so yeah. um didn't really get a chance to talk about lee but he's been awesome and oh, cool. uh, you know it's and like us you know it's like he's been doing it the same amount of time i think that's the thing it's like i'm really found a community and yes we're older a lot of us but between you know guys and shallow and Lee at No List, and um, you know, we even kind of got to know a little the uh, Jesse from Ken Mode a bit, mm-hmm. just over social media or whatever. But just talking, yeah, 
about records. It's like, I think we're all, you know, there's a community of people who are similarly still in love with heavy stuff and believe there's a rich vein of stuff to exploit and maybe we can't tour the hell out of it anymore. And, right. you know, maybe we all have families and homes and other concerns, but um, if we stay um, reasonable about about you know what what we can put into it yeah it's um it's like uh it's like beer league rock and roll yeah it's like weekend warrior kind of stuff exactly yeah yeah, exactly but it doesn't mean but yeah it's like beer league but it means uh, it means everything to me like it's i'm fully invested it's intellectually stimulating it's emotionally satisfying you know and i think at this moment in time you know I need it. Yeah, no, it's clear. I need that kind of outlet, and and this world does inform that. Yeah. Well, I sure. I appreciate what you're doing, and I appreciate you telling me about it. And yeah, I appreciate you taking the time to listen. It's, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, is there a song from uh, Hypocritic Oath that we can go out on for people to hear? Uh, you know what? I think um, because we didn't ever make a video for it. Um, but I, it's probably my favorite, one of my favorite ones to play live. I think Dear Mr. Speaker, which is the, uh, seventh track okay. and it was actually called Apathy of Pieces uh. before. <laughs> and I realized I forgot to change the, uh, I forgot to change the, uh, digital code after we got the it metadata mastered. or whatever, the metadata. So it still appears that way. It's like, it's, that's it's kind what of it says like, here on my phone. Exactly. So, but it's now called Dear Mr. Speaker. Dear Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Okay. And that's a whole other kind of story as to where after reading through um, uh, Joe Gross's uh, Fugazi book, yeah. which I did upon kind of recommendation of your podcast. Oh, cool. Um, it's like that can be, you know, should, you know, should this still be around, you know, 15, 20 years later? And should this actually be worth kind of revisiting? <laughs> that can be one of those stories where we're like, why was it called that? Where, you know, where oh, did that change? It's I like see. it always on the metadata, it always <laughs> said such and such and everything. <laughs> so, but, um, but yeah, that, that's a that's a favorite. Okay. For sure. All right. Why don't we hear it and uh, let people make up their own minds about what it might be about, and we'll revisit it 15 years from now. That sounds good. Uh, that sounds good to me. Okay. This is Dear Mr. Speaker by Not Of. John, thank you so much for being on my show and, and for making this record, and I wish you the best of luck with everything. Likewise. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Very special thanks again to John Crossingham of Not Of for being on this, the 459th episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One podcast network and is available on all iOS and Android platforms and also on things like Spotify and YouTube and Audio Boom as well. If you want to find an episode of the show that you've heard about but you can't find it on any of the things I just mentioned, Go to my website. You can also go to my website to learn more about me and sign up for my regularly scheduled newsletter. Uh, There's lots to see and do on my website. There's actually not that much, but there's some things. There's the things I mentioned. Anyway, go to the website, vishkana.com. You can also like Creative Control on Facebook. Follow the show on Twitter at Vish Creative or follow me directly at vishkana. You can also listen to a radio show version of Creative Control on Wednesdays at noon Eastern Standard Time around the world at cfru.ca on your phones or computers, or you can listen to the show on an actual radio at 93.3 FM if you're in or near Guelph. Also, please visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly uh, donation to keep this podcast going. We've had some come in of late, uh, and I appreciate it. I'm not sure maybe it's just me saying this at the end. I don't know, but I appreciate it very much. Thank you very much for your support of the show. Again, patreon.com slash creative control. Uh, thanks again to Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton for their in-kind support for this show. Thank you as well to my friend Jim Guthrie for lending me one of his songs, The Rest Is Yet to Come, on this show. Uh, you can learn more about Jim at jimguthrie.org. And finally, last but not least, thank you very much for your support of this show by listening to it and telling your friends about it and subscribing to the podcast. Uh, it means uh, a great deal. It, it means everything. If you weren't doing those things, why would any sane person be doing the things that I do? I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, thank you. I will talk to you very, very soon. Goodbye for now. <laughs>